thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we tried to get a panel that was even earlier during the day, uh, but that was completely sold out. So, you know, 7 a.m. it was. Uh, thank you and hello, my name is Anshul Mangal. I'm the president of Project Pharma and Precision Adv Advance. It's a pleasure to moderate today's discussion, what's next for advanced therapies. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Precision Advance. Since 2012, Precision's interdisciplinary teams, including Precision for Medicine, Project Pharma, and Precision Value and Health have been advancing research development, clinical manufacturing, and commercialization solutions to help innovators like the ones here transform patient lives. Having been a partner to over 80 advanced therapy companies, we know delivering an advanced therapy to market requires a comprehensive and integrated approach. Therefore, earlier this year, we launched Precision Advance, which is a collection of our services and complementary teams uniquely focused on bringing an advanced therapy to market. For more information, please stop by our booth or come up and ask questions. Now, uh, for our panel. So I'll ask each one of the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with uh, Phil. Hi, I'm, I'm Phil Sear, um, Senior Vice President of Precision Value and Health and also a member of Precision Advance. Um, and my, my job is to help innovators uh, bring through the commercial aspects of, of their products um, so that they're less barriers to getting um, products to patients. All right. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ari Session II. I'm the uh, founder, CEO, and president of Tasha Gene Therapies. Uh, we're a gene therapy spin out of UT Southwestern uh, based in Dallas uh, before Tasha. Uh, I was a chief business officer at Bridge Bio, primarily focused on the uh, gene therapy subs. And before that, I was in the same role at Avexis up until, up until the time we sold the company to Novartis. Pilati. Thank you, Anshul. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here, great to be part of this panel. My name is Palani Palani Appen. I'm EVP and CTO at Aruvent Biosciences. And um, you know, I'll give a little more introduction la later about myself. Durell. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Durell Porter, founder, CEO of Cellevol Bio, uh, a development and commercialization company focused on cell therapies. Um, before starting Cell Evolve, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about it later to Palani's point, but uh, before starting Cell Evolve, uh, I was at Gilead, uh, AbbVie, Amgen, uh, as, as well as started my career at McKinsey and Company. So looking forward to today's discussion. Last but not least, Claudia. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here at 7.15 a.m. Um, uh, looking forward to this panel. I'm Claudia Zilberg, founder and executive chairwoman of Akron Biotech. Um, compared with my colleagues here, I, I put a lot of effort in 17 years in Akron in building the company as an ancillary material compliant um, uh, place for cell and gene therapies to enable the industry to create products that are consistent uh, for patients. And before that, I was pretty much involved in human plasma and recombinant vaccine manufacturing at Nabi and then became Biotest. And uh, I'm an immunologist by training, so I understand from the very, very beginning where things go and uh, how things are moving within the patient. So trying to build a strong hold of products that uh, will create opportunities for cures. So. Thank you all. Uh, before we jump into the subject matter today, I just want to state that the opinions expressed in this panel discussion are those of the experts you see here. They do not purport to reflect the opinions or the views of their organization or arm. So before we talk about what's next for advanced therapies, I'm sure the audience would love to hear from each one of you about what's next for each one of your respective companies. All right, let's start with you. Yeah. Tasha IPO'd only five months after a Series A financing. Uh, I think the fastest to IPO, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, tell us more about Tasha and what's next for you guys. No, I appreciate the question. Uh, you know, it's just been such an exciting time uh, to be in advanced therapeutics and particularly gene therapy. Um, I had the fortunate position to be part of the original team at Avexis that actually was able to show kind of the validating nature and curative nature of what gene therapy uh, could be. And, and simply for me, it started with a child named Mateo. And Mateo was essentially a child with type 1, um, with the uh, type 1 SMA. Uh, natural history says 50% mortality by 10 months of age, 75% mortality by 12 months of age, 100% mortality by two years of age. He literally was running around 
like a normal, crazy three-year-old throwing bricks at a, at a wall, and I said, I'm never going back to anything other than gene therapy. Uh, so once we sold a, uh, a Vexus, I had the opportunity to go home, take a little bit of time off. And during that time of reflection, I took an office over at UT Southwestern, which is literally four blocks from my house. It just happened to be four blocks from my house. And um, they had the foresight to recruit, in my opinion, one of the best translational scientists in the world, and that's Dr. Stephen Gray, to form a fully integrated gene therapy group. Uh, I went over to meet with Steve, and I looked at his portfolio, um, where it, the majority of the programs were focused on monogenic diseases of the CNS. The majority uh, were, were all were AAV9, all interthecal delivery, all use HEC-293 suspension manufacturing. And he, he asked me what he should do with this. You know, should he out license to individual companies? Should he, you know, uh, just continue to, to bootstrap and fund through academics or through advocacy partners and NIH and, or what? And I just said, Steve, this is a company. This is not, this is not an academic institution. Um, and um, he asked me, he said, well, I don't know much about company starting. Would you come on and, and help me do it? And I said, no. I just said, no, no, is that what I want to do? I had a good life. I never saw my kid. For the first time in my life, I got a chance to see my kid. And um, I said, look, I'm happy to help, you know, kind of from afar, but I'm not willing to do it. And ultimately, it took a conversation between uh, my wife um, and um, my daughter for me to get off the sidelines and, and do it. And so um, uh, early last year, we formed Tasha. Uh, we funded it, we got kind of the band back together, we funded it with some of the old Avexis guys, Paul Manning, who is a board member at Avexis uh, from PBM Capital's our lead investor, Sean Nolan, uh, who's the CEO at Avexis, uh, was also one of our lead investors and also our chairman. And we raised uh, uh, $30 million in our seed round in April, quickly transitioned to a Series B, uh, which was led by Fidelity. Uh, two months later, and then two months after that, we, we went public. Um, and so it was, it was quite a ride, particularly doing that from your kitchen table. My wife was stuck in Africa during the time. She just got back about three months ago or four months ago. Um, and, um, and I was at home with my daughter. And so it, it definitely was a very interesting time. But uh, in that short period of time since uh, our IPO and since the company was formed, we're about let's say, uh, a, little, a little bit over 18 months old now. Um, we ha now have four programs in the clinic uh, on our way to five by the end of this year. We have a portfolio of about uh, 26 programs. We just added another program, um, uh, all focused on monogenic diseases of the CNS, all, for the most part, rare pediatric indications, life-threatening indications, stressed across three distinct franchises, and that's neurodegenerative, neurodevelopmental, and genetic epilepsies. Um, and really, our goal is to, is to basically uh, apply the learnings of the past, essentially what we did at, at Avexis, at scale, and to try to do this for a number of diseases. For me, no disease is too small to go after if you're able to have somewhat of a portfolio effect. And so what we do is just keep things consistent. So all of our programs are AAV9. For me, it's the most studied vector in humans to date. It's been proven safe and effective across multiple indications in the clinic, now in the commercial setting. Uh, all of our programs are interthecal delivery. It allows us to target the CNS broadly. We're able to evade neutralizing antibodies because we start on the right side of the blood-brain barrier. Um, and honestly, the proof is in the data. It's been proven safe and effective when you use in combination with AAV9. And the last piece is everything is HEC-293 suspension, same manufacturing, so it's plug and play. The only thing that we change is this is a single plasmid in our manufacturing uh, process. So it really allows us to, to uh, achieve economies of scale and, and to hopefully do something really special and, and address a large number of diseases. Thanks, R.A. Palani, our event's mission is to hope is to bring hope to patients living with rare diseases by developing life-changing and potential curative gene therapies with a near-term focus on sickle cell disease. What progress has Arvet made in finding a curative therapy for sickle cell, and what's next for you? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Anshul. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, just reflecting back, um, you know, our story, such an illustrious story. My, my journey into gene therapy started when I was in Takeda, and uh, this was a part of the diversification goal in Takeda. And, 2015, and we started thinking about gene therapy, cell therapy, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, we, you know, worked as a, you know, I worked as a part of the team that brought Lofacil uh, into market. Lofacil, if any of you know, is a product, um, you know, mesenchymal stem cell therapy, first ever approved. 
uh, really great product to treat perianal fistulas. Uh, if any of you know what that disease is, really bad disease and, and clearly a lot of value, you know, just going back to the comment about no disease um, is small enough for gene therapy. So that's one of the conditions, really debilitating condition, really uh, bad condition for people. And uh, we were able to come up with that drug. And that brought me to Sarepta where, um, you know, we put together a great uh, set of pipeline and capabilities as well. You know, uh, as, as many of you know, Sarepta used to be an RNA company. Now it's a DNA company, uh, you know, 20 plus compounds, you know, capabilities, manufacturing, PD, et cetera, et cetera. So it taught me all about AAV. And that in turn brought me to Autovent, um, you know, clear uh, idea to, you know, focus a little more on, on what we were doing. Uh, as uh, Anshul pointed out, our lead indication is sickle cell disease. Um, I'm, I'm sure I don't have to go into the details of sickle cell disease. Many of you know what that disease is and how we have dealt with that disease over the years from an equity uh, perspective. And uh, now I'm very you know, heartened to see many companies are working on this disease paradigm, trying to figure out intervention, trying to figure out cure for this uh, disease, uh, which has been ignored for a long period of time. And um, that's our lead indication. We are focused on autologous cell therapy as a way to intervene in this setting. Uh, you know, we, we um, you know, extract the patient's CD34 positive stem cells, modify it with one of the proprietary uh, hemoglobin that we have in our hand, partnered with Cincinnati Children's, and eventually infuse it back. And uh, we are in phase one, two trial, trying to complete that trial pretty soon, get back into the pivotal part of this program uh, next year. Um, so far, so good. Uh, and, and we need all of the goodwill, uh, all of the partners' goodwill that we work with to be able to keep moving uh, forward in, in, in uh, bringing this product to broader set of uh, populations, not only in the US and Europe, but we are also interested in seeing this through worldwide Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, Mediterranean, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of activities going on, uh, try to figure out you know, what cost of goods might be, um, what, what the uh, reimbursement paradigm might be, what the regulatory paradigm might be in these countries as well. And that said, we are also interested in expanding our pipeline into other areas uh, of interest, um, particularly in the metabolic diseases. We are part of the Rivant family of companies. If you know Rivant, um, you know clearly, um, you know multiple disease paradigm, multiple modalities and technology platforms within the um, group of companies. Rivant focuses on gene therapy, so we are interested in taking gene therapy as a paradigm and expand into other metabolic disorders. Uh, recently, we um, you know made a deal uh, with uh, with a group in Japan to bring an AAV program. Into, into the mix, looking at hypophosphatasia. Hypophosphatasia is a disease, uh, another debilitating disease. Uh, the children born with that disease don't last um, too long, just going back to the comment about SMA. Uh, really, really a disease that requires all of our attention. So we are interested in using AAV as a, as a way to intervene in that setting, um, unlike um, Tasha, here we are interested in AV8 as a, as a way to intervene. I'm sure, you know, if we go around, pull the room here, you know, everybody is going to say, you know, different serotypes. So we are, we are interested in AV8. It's in preclinical stage, looking forward to moving that, uh, that program into, an I, into the IND stage uh, early next year. Uh, so far, so good. Yeah, uh, you're doing continue great. Continue to keep moving, moving forward, yeah. and uh, we do need the support from everybody in this room and investors and, and so on and so forth, partners. Thank you. Terrell, um, Cellvolve has been a, the best kept secret in the cell therapy industry now for quite some time. I think your guys' <laughs> LinkedIn page just went up two days ago. Right. Uh, so can you give us an overview of the company and what you aim to achieve? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ansho. Um, yeah, so so cell evolve. He's right. We've uh, we've been relatively quiet and on uh, a slow build uh, as a company, but you'll hear a lot more from us in the coming uh, weeks and months. But cell evolve is is a development and commercialization platform company focused on on cell therapies. And uh, I founded the company just a little over a year ago, 
really looking at what we saw as, as three things, you know, first and foremost, right, this meeting, right, as representative of uh, the bio revolution and, and cell and gene therapy and the impact that it could have on patients, uh, number one. Number two is this distributed innovation. Um, we see, and all of you are representative of it, that innovation is happening everywhere, uh, both in academics, small biotechs, um, as well as across the world, uh, which is slightly different from historical norms, right? Like Big Pharma usually played uh, a big role in innovation that's not quite happening in the same way just yet in cell and gene therapy. Uh, so that was number two. And then number three is the one that's been well chronicled. I mean, commercialization in cell therapy specifically is very different than traditional pharma. And there's been lots of ink spilled on, on those challenges. And frankly, a lot of topics in this meeting, uh, we cover that. So, so we saw the three of those representing a, a unique opportunity and challenge for a company that essentially has a platform that can partner with innovators across the world, different cell types, different engineering approaches, and really advance their therapeutics to patients. So we partner with innovators at about the phase one, two stage of development, and we will develop with the collaborators and ultimately get the products approved, hopefully, and ultimately commercialize it. And so you know, what we've been doing is essentially laying the groundwork for that platform. So we've been signing up partners, we've been putting together uh, a bunch of advisors. We have a wonderful group of advisors uh, across the world. Uh, we've also been hiring a team. Some of my team members are here and, uh, and raising our initial round of financing. Uh, and we're, we're headed to Series A uh, soon enough. We probably can't keep up with, with Tasha, but... Uh, <laughs> But you know, hopefully we'll be moving to that phase fairly quickly. Um, we, you'll hear more about this coming. We, we did sign our first collaboration in the summer. And so we have a, a cell therapy that'll be entering pivotal trials early next year, targeting a condition called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Uh, it's a mouthful, I apologize about that. It's uh, PML for short. Um, and so if you watch some of the commercials with like Intivio, um, or some of the MS drugs, they mention PML as a side effect. So it, it tends to be a condition that comes from immunosuppression of really any sort. Um, but we're pursuing that, that as our first potential product and it'll be entering pivotal trials next year. And so you'll hear a lot more about the other partnerships that we're working on. Uh, we have uh, quite a few in the pipeline, uh, both from academic partners as well as companies uh, that we're working with. And so. You know, to Anshul's point, we've been, we've been relatively quiet working on these things, just trying to pull together uh, the portfolio of, of potential partners. But, you know, hopefully uh, starting today going forward, you know, we'll have the opportunity to engage with a lot of you, not only on the collaborator side, but also on the innovator side. Thanks, Rel. Claudia, uh, since 2006, Akron has been a leading manufacturer of ancillary materials for the cell and gene therapy industry. Can you give us more information on Akron and what's next for you? Yeah, <clears throat> happy to go over it. Actually, I was listening to all the panel uh, and I realized that all the intel inside to manufacture these therapies, it's something that Akron has been working for a long time. Uh, the cell and the process itself, it's very simple and the cells perhaps in the cell therapy will do the process. Uh, as a machine, but all the input that you put there has to be consistent, has to be clear how, how that may affect the cells, and it's something that we've been working hard for the last 17 years. Not only ourselves, but um, with, with the community as well, creating standards with the standard coordinating body, creating an industrial uh, platform at the end of the day so the products are consistent, the products are able to fulfill the promise of their therapies, of our, our clients and our customers and ultimately our patients. So the idea was to create that type of environment, consistency and manufacturing at scale to reduce the cost of goods, because at the end, if we look at the cost of these therapies are really, really high. And of course, the clinical trials are 
one of the major components of the cost of, of vet therapies at the end of the day, but the cost of goods and the manufacturing and the complexity of the manufacturing creates a lot of issues. So we decided to take the one part of that pie and, and work and perfect it, uh, make sure that the components were done in not only in a consistent manner, but they have uh, the regulatory uh, needs that our customers are looking for to present to the agency, to give the agency the idea that these products are done on a consistent basis, batch to batch. So the intel inside is what we've been working on. And uh, since 2019 that we were acquired uh, by our client, a private equity firm, the company's been growing tremendously. Uh, day and night, even with COVID around, the team has been working tirelessly to make sure that we not only create more products, but innovation around those products, either in the packaging, either in the delivery form, either in, in, in the testing, and making sure that um, customers receive a product that they can uh, deliver their promise. And of course, with that expansion came a new facility that we are uh, looking forward to open up at the end of December for PDNA, would be a very large one, uh, 150,000 square feet, kind of give it a take, um, but it will be basically to provide more support on the infrastructure that is much needed. Uh, we all hear about need of infrastructure, need of workforce, reduce of cost of goods, and be sure that we can deliver, and that's what we are looking for to that particular gap right now in plasmid DNA, RNA, and, and create a platform that can be plug and play for our customers moving forward. Uh, we know that there are many players in the space, but we are one more, and we are looking forward to work together in this community to make sure that it grows. Actually, I was reading uh, the NCATS release that there are 500 disease and 10,000 drugs. We have a lot to do. There is a lot of things to do moving forward. And definitely, the need of biomanufacturing infrastructure, given um, what the administration is looking for uh, in terms of becoming instead of an office. A cabinet means that life science is becoming more important and more visible in the whole space. So let's get to work, and that's what Akron is doing. Thanks, Claudia. Phil, earlier I gave a brief introduction about Advance. Can you tell us why you're so excited about Advance and how it's gonna impact the cell and gene therapy space? Yeah, thanks, Ancho, for the question. Um, one of the things that um, Ancho said earlier on is that Precision Advance is a collection of um, services across the spectrum of the development. Um, when our founders at Precision Medicine Group uh, looked at our experience all the way from specialty labs to uh, running clinical trials to manufacturing to developing the health economics outcomes research evidence to working with companies to develop their marketing strategy to engaging payers and patients, um, most importantly, um, one of the things that we saw is that we think about these things in silos, um, and they wanted to break down those silos, so they developed Precision Advance. Um, it's a collection of individuals within Precision Medicine Group that have the sole function, uh, or not sole function, but a, a major emphasis on, on cell and gene therapy. And we wanted to create communication, drive communication within Precision Medicine Group, and so we brought in Precision Advance. Um, one of the things that makes it exciting to me is that oftentimes um, uh, there are natural connections in that development cycle that we don't often think about. Um, you know, RA mentioned type one SMA. Having been one of the people involved in developing the cost effectiveness model for that, we drew upon the clinical trial data all the time. We drew upon the manufacturing um, to demonstrate the both clinical and economic value to payers. And so being able to have individuals think about that as you're developing the clinical trial, having people who are um, working at the manufacturing level informing the clinical trials. Um, so we wanted to create that communication within Precision Medicine Group, so we did that with Precision Advance. And uh, um, I'm excited because you know I can see us speeding up um, the process to regulatory approval and then also optimizing how and reducing the number of barriers patients have 
to getting these products. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about, is getting products that change people's lives as quickly as possible to them with the least amount of barriers. Thanks, Bill. I'd like to start by talking about the uh, sector's continued success and the investor community's uh, continued confidence in cell and gene therapies. Phil, um, there's no surprise that the sector has flourished due to continued investor confidence. As someone who's been following the space so closely, um, what are, you know, what are, can you provide some of the staggering statistics from this past year? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure many of us know the statistics, but you know, we've seen in the first half of 2021 that there's been uh, um, investment about $14.1 billion in the space. Um, that represents about 71% of uh, what 2020 looked like. So we're already ahead of the game. There's been 20 public offerings, um, not all of them done by RA. <laughs> 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 um, uh, 20 public offerings. There's, um, there's uh, uh, been probably about one one billion in private fa uh, private financing, um, 5.4 billion in um, in uh, in uh, uh, venture funding. Um, all of these are up over last year. I, you know, if I were to hazard a guess, this is going to continue um, because you know the amount of emerging technology which is coming out of the space is mind blowing. We see you know, gene editing, um, new derivations of gene editing coming about, um, gene circuits, uh, gene writing. Um, we see people moving uh, closer to allogeneic um, uh, cell therapies, which potentially can go into solid tumors. We see new vector technology. So I don't see it stopping. Um, I see it only growing. All right. Uh do you agree with you know kind of the in, in enthusiasm by investors with Phil's kind of stating that it's it's going to continue from in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, I certainly hope so. I I, I do think that uh, gene therapy, kind of what what I would consider traditional gene therapy, has certainly been in the doghouse this year. Uh, um, as we were going into last year, as a number of clinical holds, we we had some safety events. I I think yeah, obviously there was the FDA panel. Uh, on safety a few weeks ago. I think the good thing, though, about gene therapy uh, and, and what's come out over this is that uh, there is a balance around risk benefit and, and, and clinical unmet medical need. Um, and certainly, when you're going after diseases like Tasha is, where these are devastating, progressive, relentless diseases that ultimately end up where a patient would succumb to disease. In the case of GM2, it's three years of age, and CLN1, it's seven years of age. Um, you know, these patients ultimately, um, I, say this at, I say this in the office, they just need a shot, they need a chance to, to live. And so I think as long as we uh, continue to view uh, any potential safety risks from the lens of risk benefit, I think we'll be, um, I think we'll be on the right side. Ultimately, you know, we've had some phenomenal news come out in gene therapy. We've had some, some great data to be presented. Tasha, we've presented our, um, our two middle doses in our gynexal neuropathy study, where you see a clear halting of disease progression at two of the therapeutic doses. We still have our high dose uh, yet to come uh, later this year. Um, and again, this was the first interthecally dosed gene therapy trial in history. The trial started in 2015. We have long-term safety, long-term durability, um, good natural history, arrest of disease progression. And we just honestly need to stack up a couple more wins. I think Sarepta did a fantastic job yesterday with presenting the data, uh, long-term data on their microdystrophin program. Um, and I could probably name a couple of others where we've seen really good data. Rocket's done a fantastic job in their, um, in their uh, Dana disease program. And really, I think all these collectively will go a long way to kind of arresting in any type of fear from an investor perspective. But with that being said, to your point, it didn't stop us from raising capital. We were fortunate last year to be able to raise $307 million. Uh, we've just added another $100 million in the Lon Deluta financing about, about three months or so, uh, ago. Obviously, the, the, the equity capital markets are tough, but um, I, I do think it, it's tough for everybody. It's just not tough for gene therapy. It's, it's tough for small molecules. Um, and I do think uh, 
uh, the sentiment around biotech is that, uh, to Claudia's point, uh, innovation is here and life sciences are here. And without us, um, you could kind of see what, what could happen. Um, the global economy could shut down, obviously. Uh, families are torn apart. And I really thought we, it was fortunate to be able to see the viability of life science and innovation to take a, to, to, to take a vaccine and to go from you know, years of development and to break that down to a few months uh, just to get our lives back to normal. I, you know, finally, my parents understand what I do, <laughs> which, which, was, which was nice. But um, I, I do think you know, uh, it went a long way for the reputation of the industry and really showing uh, the world what we do. So I do think investor sentiment uh, is going to uh, continue to improve. I probably, my guess, as we get into 2022, you'll start to see um, you know, a lot of uh, investors, uh, both uh, specialists but also generalists, get back in. Jarrell, what's been your experience as you continue to fundraise for Cellevol? Is what R.A. and uh, Phil stated, do you, you hold that to be true? Yeah, no, I, I actually completely agree. I think, um, I mean, as R.A. put it, I think there's been some bumps in the road, whether it be gene therapy or cell therapy with allogene um, running into some challenges recently. I think that those bumps in the road notwithstanding, I think the trends are positive. So I, I tend to agree. Um, you know, obviously, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're headed into uh, a Series A ourselves, and so we started to talk to investors and generally been getting very positive and supportive early reads on how they're feeling about the space, cell and gene overall, uh, as well as cell therapy specifically. So I definitely agree. Palani, the industry's seen a record number of IPOs. SPACs have entered the picture as well. Do you think IPOs and SPACs will continue to be a capital strategy for early stage cell and gene therapy companies? Yeah, absolutely. I think any which way you can bring in capital into this situation, I think is, is best for the industry. You know, just let me reflect on this idea that trend is positive and the, and the, the, the fact that you, know, you need to stack up more wins um, as, as uh, companies announced results last week. Uh, you know, my thinking here is that there are two areas where we can go and figure out, you know, return on invested capital. Number one, innovation. You know, Claudia talked about it. There's, there's a variety of different innovations that can come into this. You know, my, my, you know, I had the distinct pleasure of working on biologics in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Today, I see a complete parallel to, to that situation, you know. We were, you know, if you went and searched how many products were approved in 1990, early 90s in biologics, you can count them, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20. And today you can see, you know, probably hundreds. And, and we got to get to that situation. Uh, innovation is the only way we can get there, you know, period. And the second aspect of this capabilities, we need to build a lot more capabilities, not just manufacturing capabilities, but capabilities in other areas, integrating, you know, manufacturing clinical, um, cost of goods improvements, uh, reimbursement models. There are, there are a number of ways we can build capabilities into this, and those types of areas is going to attract um, capital going forward. Claudia, uh, Ari said that gene therapy was in the doghouse this year. Um, do you think that's going to scare people away in the future? No, I think that actually one of the biggest lessons learned from COVID is that definitely the community, when come together, can do it and can do it in a very unconventional way. And I think that the mainstream today talk about RNA and DNA like if it was potatoes and everything else. Seems like it's, it's a mainstream now knowledge and adoption for patients, for physicians and the community in general, it's key to the success of the industries. It's like a, a ecosystem, you know, at the end of the day, if the patients or people are not able to say, well, this therapy may be good for me because patients take over of their own health, things will not move forward. I think that definitely after COVID, one of the biggest legacies will be that uh, gene therapy has a space that is very strong and most likely the innovation on creating platforms that can be a cassette, again, that goes in and out is going to be critical. Um, the same way that the COVID vaccines can be manufactured in four or five months, Perhaps gene therapies have to speed up, but for that also, the, the innovation comes into our side, ancillary materials, technologies, manufacturing 
uh, equipment uh, and processes and analytical to make sure that we can release those therapies in a timely fashion. So there are a lot of variables that we need to work as a community together uh, to make it happen. But definitely is there because we've proven and the point that we've proven makes sure that the investors are secure that this is going to stay. Thanks, Claudia. So can I make a point? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I, uh, Claudia just brought up a, a really interesting statement, and, and it just made me think about something. You know, we talk about gene therapy. The field's been around for quite some time, and it's gone through multiple inter iterations, and what have we gotten out of it? We have two approved gene therapies in the United States, two, AAB at, at least, and I was fortunate to be a part of one of them. And, and we see this innovation happening in the clinic, and we see you know, innovation happening uh, in academia, but it hasn't necessarily translated to a commercial uh, opportunity. And I think that's kind of the, the, the real rub, and ultimately is what's going to allow investors to really have a high degree of confidence um, that there's a significant market opportunity and economic return based off of investing in the, in the space. Obviously, you could do the math, and the math will tell you that um, there's a significant opportunity to do it, but we just haven't seen it translate into products. And, and um, a little bit of it is because we were flying the plane and building it at the same time, trying to figure out what the regulatory pathway is. The agencies, obviously, as they become more educated, they decide, you know, particularly to do certain things as well. And so, ultimately, I think we're getting it to a point to where, you know, we have a number of programs either enter entering the pivotal stage or at the pivotal stage, or really about to make that significant transition um, into the regulatory phase of development and ultimately commercialization. And I think, again, to um, Apalani's point, the more programs that we have that have been commercialized where you show uh, the, the, the opportunity of what gene therapy can be, not only from an innovation perspective, but also real world treating patients perspective, I think is going to ultimately you know, continue to uh, push investors into the space. Since you're talking about regulatory, let's let's move. Let's let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's been a great deal of high-profile setbacks this year. Mm -hmm. Biomarin, Audentis, Unicare, and others. Mm -hmm. Do you think the FDA has raised this bar on advanced therapies? Um, you know, you yeah. had a number of um, you know communications with mm -hmm. with the FDA uh, when dealing with Tasha. What's what's been your experience from? from today to yeah. back in the Avexis days, for Yeah, example. they've definitely gotten more conservative, but I think, again, when we were going through the regulatory process with Zolgensma, we were kind of teaching each other, to be quite honest. It was much more collaborative. It was, again, we had this phenomenal therapeutic that was developed at Nationwide Children's. Um, the clinical data uh, was generated before we formed the company, right? And so uh, it was really, around how do we collectively get this drug to market uh, as quickly as possible without taking, you know, um, with taking minimal risk. And, and it was a very collaborative process with the FDA, uh, as well as the EMA and, and uh, other agencies around the world. What I would say is the FDA now and other regulatory agencies have just gotten more educated about cell and gene therapy. Obviously, um, there's been some, some uh, clinical hiccups al along the way. I think what they're trying to do, and I think it's a good thing, is to kind of standardize a certain, uh, certain key aspects around gene therapy in order to reduce risk to patients. Uh, you know, immunosuppression regimens, uh, manufacturing processes, making sure you're getting to a really good um, empty full ratio, making sure you have a high degree of purity in your, in your product, making sure that your route of delivery is optimized for the disease. These are things that I think um, we should be doing as a field because, again, our goal is to do no harm first and to make sure that patients have every opportunity uh, for a therapeutic benefit. So to, to that point, at Tasha, because we have such a large portfolio, We've been in front of the uh, different regulatory agencies um, over the last, I would probably say, uh, three months. I think we've had seven interactions, um, detailed interactions, whether that's pre-CTA, pre-IND meetings, uh, different filings for scientific advice, or what, what have you. Um, and what we've, what we've found is that, um, that the regulators want to be collaborative. They want to get these therapeutics to patients, but they just want to make sure that it's done in a thoughtful, robust way. And so, so I think 
some of the things that were happening in the early days where you could kind of take an academic process and take that academic process into the clinic and then try to um, you know, switch at pivotal stage, that's done. We, we're not doing that anymore. You need to have a well-characterized process. You need to have a well-characterized understanding of your product, manufacturing, um, what the clinical endpoints are, uh, the disease space, and a really well-robust natural history in order to kind of quickly move these programs um, into the clinic and then into the, the commercial setting. Um, so it, again, I, I don't think they've raised the bar. I think they've just become more educated. Now, what I, ha I will say is, you know, they've become a little less predictable. And so we take a really interesting approach uh, at Tasha is, in any of our communication and correspondence, you always hear us, we say IND or CTA, because to be quite honest, it doesn't matter where we start a, pro a, a program or a clinical trial, we're gonna fly patients to where they need to be. So that, it doesn't matter. Our goal is to get speed of human proof of concept because ultimately that's what's gonna de-risk the programs, that's what's gonna de-risk the products, and that's gonna enable uh, an accelerated regulatory pathway. So we collectively talk to multiple agencies ar ar around the world um, um, at the same time. And the first one that, uh, that we get open is the, is the first one we're gonna start a trial. So we talk to the FDA, we talk to PI in Germany, we talk to Health Canada, we talk to um, the Israeli uh, Ministry of Health. Um, you know, it, it, we talk to MHRA, it, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, our goal is to, you know, it, it, time is neurons for us. Yep. Um, you can't get a neuron back once it's gone. So our goal is to absolutely treat patients as soon as possible, and it doesn't matter where. What that does is it reduces overall program risk and it increases probability of success and honestly increases investor confidence because we're showing them data. Um, this enables us to have data on our GAN program um, by the end of this year and to update on you know, the other doses that uh, we previously mentioned. We'll have data on our GM2 gangliosidosis program, which is the first bisystronic vector in clinical development, two genes in a single uh, AAV construct. And we'll also report data on our CLN7 Batten disease program in collaboration with our partners at UT Southwestern. This is nice because the company was just founded, but I think ultimately it shows investors that we're being good stewards of the capital that they've given us. And also patients are actually seeing the benefit of these therapeutics. Alani, I would love to get your opinion on this topic as well. Yeah, absolutely. I agree, agree with most of the, the concepts there. I, but, but having said that, I'll also be a, a bit of a contrarian uh, in that thinking in which, uh, you know, I, I reflect back. Everything I do today sort of brings me back to the 90s, you know, how we did antibody development, how did we do protein development. But if you, if you reflect back, you can see, you know, the industry as a whole at the time was concerned about safety signals in our process, manufacturing process, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, we took it upon ourselves to go ahead and, and put those studies in place, the analytical methodologies. Uh, I talked about PML, um, huge concern. There was monitoring program put in place. So we took it upon ourselves as an industry to go ahead and, and do that and educate uh, our, our counterparties, um, you know, be it regulators, be it others. And, and I think we should do that same thing today. Uh, I think, uh, you know, this is brand new modality. A um, lot is not known. Um, you know, Arya mentioned about empty versus full, and, you know, we've been talking about empty versus full for a long period of time. But how much traction did we get? Mm -hmm. Not so much. And until it took, you know, a couple of weeks ago in the adcom, you know, we talked about this again as one way that we can we can bring safety issues under control. So I think in some ways it's a it's a two way street. But I think we have an obligation as an industry to make it safe for the patients because it's new. Anything new, uh, you know, it's not like a, a you know a tablet or, or injection. I think nothing. You know, I'm not sliding anybody there. But you just you know, intervene, and this one is cure, potential cure. And because of that, we have this obligation, I believe we have this obligation to be able to do whatever we can in our power to show that it's safe and potentially efficacious, potentially cure uh, in, that, in that manner. So that's how I've been thinking about this a little bit. You know, completely in alignment, 
but a bit of a contrarian mm -hmm. um, there. Darrell, you talked about Solovol being a commercialization engine. Regulatory is going to have to be a big aspect of that. Um, what measures would you suggest a company take uh, to ensure they can anticipate and mitigate some of these regulatory hurdles? Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't add anything new, I think, to what's been said already. I think to put a fine point on it, I think early engagement and frequent engagement and partnership, I think, are the themes. And so, um, you know, we found even in our, for our PML program, which will be our first one, I mean, the FDA specifically has been extraordinarily collaborative. Um, and frankly, surprised me, sorry, um, surprised me in terms of how collaborative they were. Um, and so the communication has been fairly open. It's been two-way. They've been willing to give us feedback and be responsive uh, for this particular disease, right, that has a high unmet medical need and unfortunately is largely fatal for most patients, which most of us are in areas that have that same unfortunate characteristic. And so... You know, we found the agency to be really responsive, um, and so I tend to agree, I think, with more of RA sentiment, that as long as there's been an early and open uh, dialogue about you know, what we know and what we don't know, and some of the things that we need to sort out, um, whether it be manufacturing processes or what's the right comparator arm, uh, the size of the study, et cetera, et cetera, and endpoints, uh, all the traditional things that uh, we all struggle with, I mean, we found it to be, you know, very collaborative. And so, you know, we're going to repeat that same process over and over again going forward. Um, uh, and I think the other point I would highlight is we have been global as well, right? So we're hitting all of the regulatory agencies across the world, um, you know, EMA, MHRA, and, and the others. And so I find that same spirit, right, with all the, the other large regulatory bodies. And so... Again, I would just second everything that's been said, you know, early, often, frequent, you know, collaborative and, uh, and, and high frequency. Claudia, any final, any final comments? Yeah, actually, from our perspective, which is different, a little bit different from all of you, um, we've been working with the agency since the very beginning um, and actually together collaborated on the standard coordinating body to generate standards for the industry. Actually, ancillary materials have a standard with ISO and within the ISO group. Not only FDA sat down, but EMMA and PMDA was heavily involved. And uh, the interaction gave us the opportunity to learn what they were expecting from the ancillary materials and the intel inside that this industry were looking for uh, from the get-go. And when the drug master files were kind of not imposed, but just suggested by the agency, we took it seriously and moved it forward. So the relationship has been very um, communi communicative. We've been very fluid. Uh, we actually had a chance about three years ago, four years ago, to co-chair a um, manufacturing uh, workshop at the National Academy of Science with the FDA uh, together, and was really important to see how they see the future of the industry moving forward and where the gaps are. They have, they've been learning a lot from all of us and from every a single opportunity that they had. And, and I think that because they are very well educated now, we need to expect the bar should be higher, uh, which is good for all of us at the end of the day because we'll be translated to uh, investors that will be more secure and, uh, and the community that will be eager to receive those treatments. So nothing goes in vain, for sure. Um, I think each one of you have mentioned manufacturing at some point mm -hmm. uh, in this discussion, and it continues to be a major bottleneck. Uh, and we must, you know, for the community, we must figure out ways to solve these bottlenecks. Um, RA, you've got over 25 products in the pipeline, so manufacturing has to be a giant concern for you. <laughs> um, what is your strategy, and how are you addressing these potential bottlenecks? No, I appreciate the question. So at Tasha, we take somewhat of a three-pronged approach to manufacturing because, to, to Anshul's point, we have such a large portfolio, and it's been a significant bottleneck for uh, the industry to particularly getting programs into clinical trials because you need high-quality uh, GMP material to be able to do that. What's also been a bottleneck was also getting high-quality material to do tox studies, and now we're 
most of the agencies are going, they want you to do NHP talk studies, and that takes a large amount of uh, material. At Tasha, what we would like to do, uh, ultimately, um, for most of our programs, uh, we like to actually do our talk studies with the same material that are actually going into patients. It makes an easier analytical profile, comparability profile, and ultimately discussion with the regulatory agencies much easier. Now, with that being said, um, to, to Anshul's point, we have a really large portfolio and we're doing a lot in, in parallel. And so a good chunk of our expense line in our P&L is manufacturing. So in November, we announced, uh, the, uh, we, we announced the, uh, the signing of a lease for our own internal manufacturing facility. This is gonna be located in Durham, North Carolina. It's a large facility, it's 187,000 square foot. Uh, this is a multi-product facility. Uh, it'll have 2,000 liters worth of capacity, uh, multiple uh, production suites, uh, multiple clean rooms, process development, analytical capabilities, as well as release testing, and, and um, fill finish capabilities as well. We also have the opportunity to double that capacity if we ever need it. This is enough capacity that'll be able to uh, meet our uh, early uh, preclinical development needs as well as our late stage commercialization leads. But, you know, that facility won't fully come online until 2023. So what do we do in the interim? And, and what we've done in the interim is lean on our partners. We have uh, access to uh, a, a GMP facility in Dallas at UT Southwestern. Our office is literally right across the street from UT Southwestern. Uh, this is a 500 liter um, this is a 500 liter bioreactor capacity running the same uh, manufacturing process that, that we run. And again, this is part of our thesis around uh, keeping economies of scale. So we run for everything, AAV9, HEC293, uh, triple plasma transfection in suspension. That's an identical process within the Sartorius bioreactor. We run that at UT Southwestern. Uh, we run that at Catalan at our partners, and then we, we're going to be running that in North Carolina. And it, it allows us to be able to kind of bridge from one facility uh, to the next and essentially get like-for-like -like process. We do this at the early stage. We do it at the 50-liter bioreactor for early preclinical material. We scale it up to two, 200 liters and then eventually uh, to the 500 where we max out because we think the process kind of breaks down above that. Um, and, and so I think for us, what we've done is we've gone out and tried to partner with some of the best uh, CDMO partners around the world in order to ensure that we have high quality material uh, for clinical trials. Fortunate for, fortunate for me and fortunate for a number of the people at Tasha is that um, in a number of these cases, we, we were teaching each other the manufacturing process for AAV through this saga of Zolgensma eventually figuring it out, moving from a hyperstack process to the Icellus uh, in order to get the program commercialized. And so we partnered really closely with a number of CDMOs, but most notably Catalan. Um, and their team up in Baltimore, which did a fantastic job. And so we've been fortunate to you know, kind of extend that partnership at Tasha um, over the last year. We've simultaneously had five GMP runs running at the same time uh, across our portfolio, which is literally crazy to try to get to, to try to keep that straight. But it really does show uh, just the power of being able to have uh, a good network and, and, and a good partnership uh, with high quality manufacturers. For our gynexone neuropathy program, we're approaching regulatory discussions around what the what the uh, registration pathway is going to look like. So it was important for us to make the case to the agencies around the world that our our clinical program and our clinical material is the same material that is ultimately going to be translated in the commercial setting. So in order to ensure that, we're going with the same CDMO partner that manufactured, um, that manufactured the uh, clinical trial material, and that's Viral Gene, and they do a fantastic job, the Ask Bio uh, subsidiary in San Sebastian, Spain. So literally, we're using the same cell line, we're using the same media, we're using the same bioreactors. All we're doing is moving from the clinical manufacturing facility to the commercial facility in order to uh, scale this product up for commercialization. So for, for us, 
it's really about speed, not only for human proof of concept, but speed to registration. And if it's not broke, you don't fix it. You hear me say this all the time in our, in our meetings, if, if it works, stop. And so, and so that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing um, with John Exxon and Neuropathy. We have a product that works. We have a process that works. Um, and so that's the process that we're locking down and, and we're going into. And essentially, what we're going to do is go, go into the agency, uh, the FDA particularly, and just you know, recite their own guidance back to them. Um, you know, about nine months ago, the FDA issued guidance around the development of gene therapy uh, for neurodegenerative diseases. Nine months was a long time ago, and I think most people forget that there's actual guidance out there that they issued because so much has happened. But really, it talks about, again, having a well-characterized product when it's important um, to do analytical comparability versus clinical comparability, making sure that, uh, because the product is, the process is the product, right? So making sure that there's consistency from batch to batch and how that translates ultimately uh, to the clinic and registration. And so for us, we're fortunate for our lead program, Tasha 120, it checks all those boxes, and, and, and so we're going to continue, even when our manufacturing facility comes online in 2023, we're going to continue to maintain a pretty uh, robust um, uh, slate of uh, uh, CDMO partners that we collaborate with. It's the only way in order to make sure that uh, you have high-quality material in the time and when you need it. Jarrell, um, you know, unlike Tasha, you know, Silvoff's fairly... Uh, young in its development. Mm -hmm. Is manufacturing even a worry for you yet? <laughs> uh, definitely. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's a fair question, though. I think, you know, the classic make versus buy decision uh, for manufacturing. On the cell, cell therapy side, we have gone down the route of essentially buying manufacturing. And uh, early on, when I first started the company, that was question number one. They were just like, what are you going to do about manufacturing? And at that time, I had already strategically decided that we were going to buy as opposed to build. And I got total pushback from everybody <laughs> on that one. Uh, but I think, you know, fortunately, over time, folks, I think, have come to see uh, the possible benefits of buying versus, versus uh, making or building. Uh, so we are essentially partnering with uh, a number of manufacturers. You know, very similar, I think, to some of the comments already made that uh, we have found that we are focused on really three core capabilities in CellEvolve. And, you know, it's curation, which is basically identifying and partnering with, uh, with innovators across the world. Number two is development. And so actually uh, moving the programs through clinical trials. And then commercialization, which manufacturing is a piece of that puzzle. And what we thought is we were going to stick to our knitting on the commercial part around manufacturing, and we collaborate with folks that are, that are um, you know, excellent and world class at that. So we have two different approaches. So one is with our innovators. Many of our innovators have their own manufacturing capabilities. And so you know, consistent, I think, with the comments that RA made, if it isn't broke, don't, you know, if, don't try to fix it. So if they already have a manufacturing process, we stick with it. And so we have found that many of the, the innovators we're speaking to already have capabilities. They've been making these products for some time. And so we just lean heavily on them and into that process. And that, that has been working thus far, number one. Number two, on the commercial scale side, you know, and as we all know, there's been a ton of capital poured into the CDMO space on the cell therapy side, and so we're riding that wave. And so what we're doing is talking to, and, and hopefully soon we'll announce um, a partnership with a large CDMO, uh, and that will be our preferred partner for manufacturing commercial cell therapies. And so, you know, we are leaning very heavily on those two collaborators. And, you know, what we've also found is, and I'll just pick on academics as a notable example, a lot of these academic partners have their own facilities, and many of those facilities are underutilized, right? They don't have enough products going through it. And so I have found almost unprompted Many of these partners will say to us, um, well, you know, we'd like to continue to make clinical supply. 
Um, as we move down the road in terms of later stage clinical development, we would also like to explore commercial supply, recognizing that needs more investment, maybe some additional capabilities and possibly an expansion of capacity. But that's more of an expansion of capacity as opposed to trying to pick the process up and move it to another manufacturer. And so we have found that to be a, a fruitful, I say, engagement at this point. We haven't pulled the trigger on that strategy just yet, but um, I, I only bring that up as an example just to say that there is a lot of opportunity out there from that perspective. Um, and we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, but we have definitely found this partnering approach both on the innovator side as well as the commercial CDMO side fruitful for us today. So Polani, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, Darrell's very much on the decentralized approach for now. Uh, tasha has got a hybrid approach using CDMO partners while scaling up an internal facility. Can you tell us what the right answer is? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. The right answer is there is no one size mm -hmm. fits all, yeah. right? I think that's the, that's the idea. Companies are in different places and different resources, different paradigms. So there's, there's really no one size fits all. You know, just to give you an example, of our event, we are interested in sickle cell disease. It may, be con may be considered a rare disease, but I would rather say that it's not a rare disease, it's a more prevalent disease. Uh, there, are, there are tens of thousands of patients out there who needs this, and it is an autologous cell therapy. Just to give you an example of complexity, from the time the patient gets into the trial and are into the, to get the drug, and the infusion of the drug, it takes about, I would say, five to six months. They need to be, you know, relieved of the sickle, you know, hemoglobin from the system, conditioned, extraction of the bone marrow, CD, you know, CD34 cells, modification of the laboratory, and, you know, release the drug product, infuse it back. It takes about six months. So we see manufacturing as not just, you know, going in there and, and producing these materials, rather from the time the patient gets into the trial to the time that the, the patient receives the drug and monitored for a few, few months. So a lot of complexities, a lot of things need to line up uh, because you can't really mix patient cells. Right? That, that's going to be uh, pretty bad. Uh, so we, we are looking at manufacturing from that perspective, and obviously there could be things that you could do in-house and we need partners, like I said early on, we need a lot of partners for us to be successful. And that's where we are. We are in a hybrid situation. We are engaging, as my colleagues pointed out here, we are, we are engaging the global CDMOs. There are, there are good, good CDMOs out there who have figured out we use lentivirus, another, another complex complexity there, uh, slightly bigger virus, so hard to process, hard to filter hard to produce, um, and, and so different paradigm, different solution, but we need innovation every which way we look at. You know, this goes back to Claudia's point, and that's, that's why innovation is so important. It's not just um, you know, making a, a great productivity of a cell line makes innovation. It could be you know, how you know, a particular um, you know, logistics person brings the product from one place to another could be an innovative solution for, for some of these things. Chain of identity, chain of custody, all of this is going to be a key um, in, in thinking through this. Uh, so we are in a hybrid hybrid situation. Yeah. You didn't give us we'll a continue to be in a hybrid situation in a com commercial setting. So you can't give us an answer, is that what you're telling us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, just checking. Uh, Claudia, um, as innovators like, you know, Tasha, Aruvan, Cellevolve scale up, so will suppliers have to meet you know, scale up to meet their needs. Um, how are you foreseeing these challenges and how are you looking to scale? We've been looking into scale and cost of goods very closely since our early days. And uh, so it's not, not new to us, but definitely now with um, the, uh, the, the new facility coming up and, and, and PDNA and other products related uh, for transfection or small molecules, they feel finished capacity, that, the amount of tanks that we may have, and the team that uh, comes along from pharma 
definitely will position ourselves uh, strongly in the market to, to be one more player if need to be, and so that uh, there is not shortages of any of these components. Uh, we know and we are suffering right now from supply chain shortages is just the common uh, denominator I'm talking between workforce and supply chain is the conversation of the day. But definitely uh, we believe that um, we've been working hard in building a facility that will have enough capacity to build um, more therapies in the space and compliance as well, because it's not only the capacity, but also the compliance at a cost that it's feasible. And that's something that we've been doing with the two sites in Florida and sites that we have around the world, uh, manufacturing our products um, in a pharmaceutical setting, which is very critical for us. So yes, looking into it carefully and making sure that you use what you need, not waste, because waste is also a lot of cost that is involved. Hey, Claudia. Uh, Phil, as you know, RA and Claudia build these massive manufacturing facilities, uh, talent's gonna become an issue. Um, and I think everybody in this room knows about the various talent bottlenecks that are out there. Uh, how do we mitigate these bottlenecks? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we mentioned manufacturing, and there's definitely a bottleneck there. Um, but it's really across the board because there just aren't enough people with cell and gene therapy experience. Um, when you think about mitigating it, there are a couple of approaches. We've already heard some of them. I don't know how many times I counted partner. Um, partnering as your company evolves um, is a good way of doing it, and they can actually help train your growth as it's coming. So from a, an organization standpoint, that, that's a good way of doing it. Um, on sort of a more macro level, more programs in schools focused on cell and gene therapy from a scientific standpoint, but also even from a commercialization standpoint. Um, being able to find people who are transferable, um, similar skill sets. If anybody's dealt with a biologic, they can probably be trained or given those little pieces of, of missing, missing DNA to do cell and gene therapy. Um, and so I think that, that serves an, as another, another possibility. But you know, there's a macro aspect, which is, is really education and transferability within the pharma industry. And then there's sort of the micro level, which is, which is partners. Thanks, Phil. I'd like to move into another topic, pricing. Uh, we know that conventional pricing and re reimbursement models continue to present a challenge. While these innovative pricing and reimbursement models seem good on paper, once we get into the details, they're often not feasible yeah. or can't be implemented. Um, based on your experience, Phil, how, re how receptive are payers to these innovative reimbursement models? How does the evidence impact those models? And what have been some of the major drivers behind the implementation of these models? Yeah, and I think um, I go back to a couple of products that have been launched, Solgensma, Luxterna, Yescarta, Chemraya. Um, I was recently on a panel with, with someone from Spark, and, and she was saying, you know, two years beforehand, every payer they would visit would be like, you know, we want a reimburse, uh, innovative reimbursement model. We want a re innovative reimbursement model. And then as they got closer and they showed up, well, here's a couple of options. Ooh, wow, that looks difficult. <laughs> and then everybody started trying to figure out a simpler, simpler way of, of, of doing, doing that. Um, I think that payers are receptive. They like the idea of paying for what they get. Um, the mechanisms within a payer aren't there to measure it. Um, having worked at a payer, ju just not there. Um, I think what it has, or what it is doing is it's forcing, like there's a conversation between manufacturers and the FDA that's very open. It's forcing a conversation within manufacturers and, and payers that is probably the most open I've, I've seen. I was on a recent panel with the head of cell gene therapy for a large, um, large national payer. And he was actually saying, he's like, listen, we want these products. If they're safe and, and clinical, uh, clinically, um, uh, clinically effective, we want these products. The issue is, is that 
most of my job is running around to employers who are literally having MIs because what if one of my employees you know, needs one of these? And how to help employers and payers predict. I think the biggest, biggest, thing, biggest piece of advice I can give someone about approaching payers with cell and gene therapies is a payer is defined by an actuary. An actuary likes predictability. Any tool, piece of evidence you can give a payer to help them figure out predictability, help them simulate that in the future, the more comfortable they're going to get. They don't want to keep these products off the market. They just want predictability. Thanks, Joe. I think uh, the, the question is, is slightly different, or the answer is slightly different when you talk about XUS, because I think it is yes. much easier when you think about commercialization XUS because these are single payer systems. I think the issue in the United States is because most patients don't stay with the single payer for what, more than a few months to, to a year or so. And so um, a payer that strikes a deal with a manufacturer around a certain patient uh, and pays up front for that is essentially paying for uh, a patient that, that's going to leave in, in, a, in, a, in a year or so, or vice versa. They strike a deal for someone else to pay. And so I think that's really where the fear comes from, and to your point, that level of predictability. But in but XUS, because in most countries outside the United States, these are single-payer systems. Patients aren't moving from one, one private insurer to the next. So it does give the opportunity to do something that's a little bit more uh, creative and being able to um, being able to structure something um, focused on a certain outcome at a certain point. And you can kind of tie that to um, clinical data and what you've seen from a clinical experience and, and then kind of model, th model that out. That, that's, that's what we did um, you know, as we were thinking about commercializing Zolgensma XUS. Also, what was really important, and it's something that, that plays into, again, our own program uh, for gynex and neuropathy as we're about to start having these conversations is, is really proving um, the uh, viability of the product by comparing it to you know, the, current, the current cost of treatment today. I think most of these products, at least I could say in the example of gynosome neuropathy, it's going to be cost savings because this is a disease that presents at age three. Patients, patients progress to a wheelchair um, in their you know, late adolescence, early teens. They progress to death in their late teens, early 20s, you know, onto a respirator and whatnot. This is extremely uh, expensive type of therapy. They're in and out of the hospital. Um, they're always having a crisis. And if you're able to show just the cost of treating these patients today, just the, just the total cost of treating them for their entire lives, and then the cost of the therapeutic and what you can offset based off of your own clinical data, um, you know, in most cases, this would be cost savings. And you're just able to run a discounted cash flow. It's, it's a straight MPV, and you see the difference. What's the MPV on product? What's the MPV off product? And you just present that data. Um, a lot of payers don't like facts, though. And that's the, only, and that's the, and that's the problem. You can present that to them, and uh, sometimes they're not accepting of it. But ultimately, if you have the real world data, which I think now we're getting to the point to where gene therapy is starting to mature, a lot of it in the early days was modeling. We didn't have five years worth of durability data yet or, or even beyond that. Now, in a lot of cases, in the case of our giant on neuropathy program, we're at six years of durability data. So we know what the product is going to give us, and we know kind of what that looks like compared to natural history. And in the case of giant on neuropathy, we use a, a endpoint called the MFM32. It's like the CHOP and 10 score for, for older kids. And we know at certain points, they're going to hit a milestone. They're either going to go to a wheelchair at a certain point on the MFM32. They're going to go to a ventilator at a certain point on the MFM32. And ultimately, eventually, they'll succumb. Uh, to the disease, so we know if we can stabilize patients before they hit one of these, you know, significant milestones, you're then able to show what that cost savings is at a particular time point uh, to payers and ultimately the healthcare system. And then the conversation just becomes: How much of the value does the innovator keep, and how much of the value do you generate back to the healthcare system? And so this should be a simple conversation. To your point, when we were going out to talk to payers in the U.S. 
they they all wanted an innovative system until you brought them one, and then they were like, yeah, we'll just pay for it. So so you know that also doesn't speak well for innovation too, because main, you know innovators and manufacturers see that we know you're going to pay for it, so. Why would we bring you innovation? We just pay for it. And so it, it needs to be a little bit more uh, collaborative um, and, and a little bit more of an open dialogue. If I could add one thing to what, what Ari was saying is, is I think in the early stages, he brought up the fact that we were modeling it. And it was a certain amount of pixie dust. Yeah. OK? <laughs> um, the one thing organizations can do that's so important, and, and I know Tasha's doing it, is really focus on natural history mm -hmm. and the cost that's accruing. Mm -hmm. Because over a period of time, this should be a simple arithmetic yeah. <laughs> for payers. <Yeah. laughs> but we haven't. We've had to go with really bizarre models like Monte Carlo simulations. Mm -hmm. And when you go into a pharmacy director, they go, oh, yeah. Higher math, no. <laughs> yeah. right, so just, um, I have one, one macro comment. So I agree with everything that was said before, um, but it, this is more of a, a plea. I actually think we're losing the war on reimbursement. I, everything that was said, and I completely concur, but I, and I'm sure this happens to all of us, but if you talk to people that are not in the industry, and they say, oh, well, what do you do for a living? And I tell them, you know, depending on their knowledge, I may say I work in pharmaceuticals all the way down to cell therapy. And universally, within the first two minutes, prices come up. Yeah. And it's negative, right? They all say, what's going on with your industry? Like, why, you know, I don't understand. Like, why are things so expensive? And you know, I find myself on my heels trying to say, oh, you know, we have life-saving drugs, right, et cetera, et cetera. It never works, right? Like at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, we're losing the war. Like what's happening is that our whole space is tainted. I mean, you see this in all the public polls. It's all these bills keep coming up when they're trying to control pricing. So I actually think we need to do, and this is beyond cell and gene therapy. I think we're clearly on the bleeding edge working on innovative advanced therapeutics, generally trying to address high unmet medical need areas. And so we're all doing the right thing, but we're definitely losing the macro battle here. And I think we need to find a way to take what we're doing and combine it with our more traditional brothers and sisters on the small molecule and large molecule side and get the, our narrative together. Like, we're, we're just getting killed on this everywhere. And I, it's amazing, even family members who, you know, I've been in this business like most of us for decades, and I still get it from my parents, right? They're just like, I don't understand. Like, why are drugs so expensive? And, you know, and, and, you know again, I go through my, my story, um, which at the end of the day doesn't address the issue, right? They're still expensive. And so I, that's more of a plea, right, to us, right, as a collective that, you know, and I know ARM is playing a big role, and this is a topic for discussion during this conference, but we have to get our act together on this one. Like, I, again, individually, I think we'll continue to be successful, but ultimately, at some point, society will respond, whether it be just small baby steps over time or a macro step uh, in the U.S., whether it be some legislation or something. I think that uh, we, we need to try eventually put some innovation here as well and create um, either an entity that will buffer the industry to the payers or uh, that is a financial institution yeah. or somehow create a model that uh, facilitates the conversation. Seems like the is a circle that, that we, no, we never break it because payers have a way to see the industry and the reimbursement world. And we are bringing therapies that for them perhaps fits more the model of a treatment. And it's becoming a little bit of a back and forth. So eventually we need to create maybe an entity. And at one point, I know that maybe you guys have heard that Bezos put something and Amazon were looking into a new healthcare venture. They didn't work out, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's all the things try and error and see what what can be done that perhaps for us should be a new model, that we are looking to go again, uh, you know, with a round ball in a square yeah. 
and, and, and we are not doing it well, so why to keep trying? Why don't you, we open up our minds and create an innovative structure that will help us um, and interface with the payers and the manufacturers? Lonnie, the, the advanced therapy industry have been, has been traditionally for rare disease. You even mentioned you know, sickle cell, you don't view that as a rare disease. How will the growing pipe, pipeline for more prevalent condition you know, change the models and the evidence? Well, certainly, uh, just going back, to, if I can make a comment about this yeah. discussion, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, this idea of it has to be simpler, right? Yeah. And, and that arithmetic work, if you know what your variables are, in, in my thinking, the variables here are durability. We know in some settings we have some durability data, but it's not universal. You know, there is an inherent conflict of, you know, what we are saying. We are going to cure a disease with one shot. And, but, you know, payers are going to be not, not completely convinced, you know, if you show only three years or four years or even five years. I think there is an in inherent con conflict about how we position versus, you know, what those variables will, um, you know, define that equation that uh, Phil is talking about. I think there's also another variable in that, which is cost averse, yeah. right? You talk about viability. Mm -hmm. you know, I take that as a sustainability. Mm -hmm. you know, how, yeah. how, how can you sustain this mm -hmm. you know, to make it equitable for everybody is the key question uh, in this business. So if you have more um, ways of intervening in that disease setting, it's going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And in, in, especially in sickle cell, you know, if, you, if you so discover the literature, you can see about 15 companies working on a variety of different ways to intervene in that setting. And whether in any of these is going to be one injection that's going to cure this disease, we don't know today. Uh, but, but if we can get to it, I think it's going to be a, a lot of goodwill uh, you know, out mm -hmm. there for this. And, and still, I think reimbursement is going to be a paradigm. Uh, it's going to be a hard paradigm because people, when they pay, they are reluctant, mm -hmm. even if you say you got magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's going to be the issue. Thanks, guys. But Last we'll question uh, that I have for all of you. Um, talked about, we've heard about a lot of new technologies coming up in, the, you know, in this past year from gene editing, gene writing, new vector technology. What are you guys excited about in, this, in this, uh, the rest of this year and in, in the coming years for cell and gene therapy? All right. Sure, I appreciate the question. The only thing that I can concentrate on is, is Tasha and kind of where, <laughs> and where we're going. Um, that takes up the majority of my time and, and my nine-year-old. But, but um, really what I'm excited about, I would say, is uh, generating some, some high-quality data um, on, on a couple of our key programs that uh, we'll have reading out here in, in Q4. Uh, giant exonal neuropathy, GM2 gangliosidosis, and again, from an innovation perspective, the GM2 program is, is, is extremely innovative. This is the first bicystronic vector in clinical development, two genes packaged into a single AV9 construct to form a fully functioning heterodimer, uh, which should address both Sandhoff's and tay -Sachs disease. Um, and so really excited about that because that kind of opens the door for other bisystronic vectors. Um, obviously, um, continued progress on our CLN7 program, but really um, what I'm most excited about, if I had to say anything, was our Rett syndrome program. Rett syndrome is a devastating disease. People have been trying to tackle this from a gene therapy perspective for a number of years, and the problem with Rett syndrome is that uh, it mostly affects young, young girls, and the problem with it is that these girls are mosaics, uh, which, and, and, and not meaning that they have 50% expression in every cell, it means that half of their cells are normal and half of their cells are null, so, so no protein. The problem is uh, it's a very narrow therapeutic window, if there's a therapeutic window at, at all. Uh, two times overexpression in normal cells, you get another disease called MECP2 duplication or RET duplication, which is just as bad as RET, to be quite frank. So any overexpression in a normal cell, just 200 or 200% uh, or two times, you get MECP2 duplication. If you don't get enough expression in the null cells, you, you basically don't get a therapeutic benefit over or if you overexpression in the null cells, um, you, don't, you, you basically give a disease, MECP2 duplication. So the, the window is really tight. 
and this is where innovation takes time, but when it, when it happens, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing. Uh, our scientific um, advisor, Dr. Stephen Gray, basically over 15 years derived a self-regulatory feedback loop that, you, that basically hijacks the bodies and the cells endogenous uh, response to overexpression of MACP2. So what he's, and it's a platform we call MI Rare. Uh, and so essentially what happens is the, uh, the gene therapy enters the cell, pops out, start expressing MECP2. Uh, MECP2 levels start to rise within the cell. This triggers the response of endogenous microRNAs, down regulatory microRNAs, that essentially come down and bind to the transgene, ultimately lowering the MECP2 expression, allowing it to self-regulate on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, which is extremely important. Um, and we've had the first demonstration and quantification of this was published in Brain uh, in May of this year, where we actually show minimal expression in, um, in normal cells and therapeutic expression in um, the null or disease cells, the first time showing genotype expression of MECP2. This is really gonna go a long way for enabling this therapy to enter the clinic. And so um, we're on track to uh, have our clinical development program open by the end of this year. And um, we're gonna be going into adult patients because we wanna make sure we prove safety on this mechanism first, quickly moving down to pediatric uh, girls and then actually moving into boys. There's, uh, there was always thought that Rett syndrome only affects girls because most boys die in utero. But there's probably 200, 300 boy, uh, boys out there that have some level, depending on their level of mo uh, mosaicism, that have Rett syndrome. And so we'll be expanding our development program um, uh, to, uh, to males later, later next year as well. And so that'll enable data uh, by the end of the year. And, and we're quite excited about that, that level of innovation. Thanks. Durell? So um, 30 seconds. So Cell Evolve and then industry-wise. So Cell Evolve, we, we're working on several partnerships, as I alluded before. And so um, in the coming weeks and months, we'll announce those publicly. Uh, as well as our Series A financing, um, and then ultimately starting our first pivotal trial for PML uh, in the first half of next year. So uh, really, really excited about that, and you know, look forward to talking and collaborating with many of you in the audience here. Industry-wide, you know, we've been hearing a lot about this projected wave of product approvals in cell and gene therapy in the coming years, and it's actually starting to happen, right? And so you can just see the number of pipeline products that are either approved or soon to be approved and right on the near-term horizon. And so, you know, going back to the opening question about investor sentiment and generally the, the market view of what we're doing in cell and gene therapy, at the end of the day, you know, approved therapies that address diseases is will, will change the overall sentiment and support the sentiment for the market. And so I really look forward to that. Claudia, last words? Yes. Um, well, looking forward to, to the growth of, uh, of Akron in the next coming years on the PDNA space with a lot of more adjacent products that we are working on. So stay tuned for that. Uh, technologies that will support the platforms in the RNA space and the DNA space, uh, not only uh, in, in the um, enzymatic manufacturing or also th synthetic manufacturing, but also in other products that are really, will support the, the transfection and non-viral delivery of, of these therapeutic options. So definitely looking for the next uh, coming years with a lot of new products and the pulse in the industry to make sure that we are two steps ahead of all of you to make sure that um, we are serving the industry properly with the right products for you to succeed. And that's what we're planning to do. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the panelists for their amazing discussion today. And thank you for ARM for hosting us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.